Okay, how are you going so far? Here we are in part three. We're gonna start moving our viruses around in the scene and we want them to kind of float. So that's why we've turned off the gravity on them. Now, just out of interest, if you went back into your virus prefab and tried turning on the gravity, if you haven't already, just set that to one there on the prefab, then if you just press play, you'll be able to see the gravity working. Now, if there's anything for it to hit, such as another entity, which is a physics body, then it would actually bounce on there. Uh, but we don't have anything. So you can see they're all now just falling down there. And in fact, let's just show you how that works while we're here. So I'm quickly going to add in to the hierarchy a plane. Actually, I'll make it a cube so it has a bit of substance. And let's just uh, move that down a little bit. Now, these uh, things are spawning between 50 and negative 50. So it doesn't really matter where you put the plane because this is just for demonstration purposes. And let's just make it a bit bigger so that we can see it and let's just move it into view there then what i'll do is quickly add onto it a physics body and a physics shape now what we want to do is not have the cube fall under gravity so the way you do that is actually go up to the physics body and where it says dynamic just set that to static instead now, do you have to run this cube through the entity conversion system that we have in our ECS manager, which is what we do for converting our viruses? Well, no, we don't. If you want to just have another entity in your scene, but you don't want it to have to go through code and be involved in that, just go to add component. Let's just roll these up so we can see things. Add component, and then you just want to put in convert to entity and that's going to automatically do it for you so that's the script that will just make that cube into an entity then if we press play our viruses are going to fall down and they're going to hit and bounce off that ground plane okay so let's have a look looks like i didn't make that big enough <laughs> So we just come back into here and make it much bigger so it's going to bounce and press play and here we go okay so they've all landed and now they're rolling around on there and you can see them all also in the scene view doing the same thing okay but that's not what we want but i was just showing you so now remove that cube Let's go back into our virus and let's take off the gravity factor on the body. Zero. All right, so now how are we going to move these viruses? Now, remember, once you've created them, they become an entity and you can't sort of grab them via the hierarchy. So you don't go like game object, find object with tag or whatever, like you might have done in the past. Instead, you actually have to find the entity. Now, it's a very similar system that we use in order to get hold of an entity. And we can do that by looking up a particular component. Because remember, all of the items that you make, the entities that have the same set of components on them, go into the same chunks in memory. That means that if we tag this virus with another component, uh, let's say it's called float, then it and all its brothers and sisters that have the float component on them will be in the same spot in memory. And then when it comes time to access them, it just makes it so much faster. And so that's why uh, this ECS is fast, or at least one of the reasons why it is much faster. So let's create a C-sharp script and we're gonna call that float data. And we're going to open that up in the editor. Now, this is going to be very short code. It's also going to be a structure, not a class. So we put public struct float data. And it's not a mono behavior. It's an I component data. Now, it doesn't need anything in here except using unity.entities. And we also need to put in generate authoring component at the top. Now, if you leave that out, it won't let you attach it in the inspector, as I'll show you in a moment. 
We're also, while we're in here, going to add in some properties. So public float speed. Now, because this is a struct, you can't actually set the value in here now. So you can't initialize this speed value. So I will show you how you do that. All right, so save that. Let's go back into Unity. We're going to click on one of our viruses or our virus prefab, which we should only have one of, by the way, and get that float data and drag and drop it over into the inspector. Now you can see it sitting there and it's got this speed. Now if I set that speed to say five here, every single virus that gets instantiated will have a speed of five. Okay, now if you want that to be random, you have to do it back in the ECS manager when you create these things. So I'll show you how to do that. So let's open up the ECS manager. Remember, this is the code creating your entity. This line here is setting the component for translation, but we can do the same thing for our own custom component. So it looks like this manager dot set component data instance new float data bracket now it's not called value we called it speed so we use the speed and then we can set it to some particular float value so if I went 0 0.1 in here and then just finish that off with a squiggly bracket and a rounded bracket all of your virus is going to have the same speed if you wanted them to have a bit of a random speed around them, you need to create a random value inside of here and pass it through into there. So let's just above here create that. So let's say a float um, R speed equals, and then we're going to have unity engine dot random range. And let's go between one and 10, but I want it to be quite small. So I'm going to put divided by 10.0 F in there. So that's going to make it a point value. And then we just pass that through here. So R speed into there. And now we've got access to this when we start to move our viruses. Okay, so save that. Let's go back into Unity and write our moving code. Now, in the traditional way of using Unity, you would write moving code and you would either have one particular object in the hierarchy that would loop through all of the objects and move them, or you would have some kind of moving script and you would attach it to the um, particular game object. You can't do that with entities, okay? They don't have script as such attached to them. They only have data attached to them, which makes them quite lightweight. So in order to process them, we have to create what's called a system. So let's create another C sharp script and let's call this our float system. Okay, so open that up. Now the float system is a class, but it's not a mono behavior. So it is a job component system and it has a whole bunch of libraries that we have to put at the top. I'm going to cheat a little and just paste these in here and then go through them. So uh, unity.entities, unity.mathematics, unity.transforms, unity.jobs, unity.collections, and unity.physics. Okay, and that's going to allow you to process this system. Okay, now it doesn't have a start and an update. Instead, it has a on update, which is basically going to contain a job, which is parallel computing. So protected override job handle on update you could see it wanted to finish that code for me there now we're not throwing anything so just get rid of that and instead we're going to return our job handle and we're going to create the job handle just above here and that'll be job handle with a lowercase j so the first thing in here is we're going to create ourselves a delta time value. So float dt equals time dot delta time. There's still a lot of Unity code that you're familiar with that you can still use inside of here. It's just some of the things are quite restrictive. Now, what we're going to create now is a job. Now, 
what you put inside of a job system has to be uh, the entity version, I guess, of all of the maths and the transforms and things like that, which you'll see. And if you try and do something fancy inside of this particular job, you'll get a lot of sort of errors. Okay, so uh, let's also now declare our job handle. So job handle equals entities. with name okay now the name assigned here is going to be our float system dot for each and the syntax for this is quite interesting so make sure that you get all of your brackets and squiggly brackets and semicolons and things correct for it so inside of here first of all we want ref physics velocity physics ref translation position ref rotation rotation ref float data float data okay rounded bracket equal sign and then a greater than sign and then inside of here is where we're going to do our processing for our for each. Okay, and then once we've done that, we go dot schedule. And when you schedule a job, you have to pass through some other job that's dependent on. And we're just going to put um, input depths at this point because that's what's coming back as a job handle here into here, which means that this job cannot run until this job has com been completed and this job actually doesn't really exist so this is going to run anyway now once we've done that we also need to put in a job handle dot complete because the job gets scheduled in the system okay and it goes off and does itself when it's got time and processing available to it if you don't put job handle dot complete then it will come back around and allow this job to run again on top of itself when it's already running this forces that particular job to have completed before it will start another round now this is parallel processing, this bit here, this for each, okay? It's like a loop, but it's a parallel loop. So instead of doing one thing at a time, like one game object at a time that it processes, it can process a whole bunch at exactly the same time using the multi-core functionality in your computer. And that's what makes it really, really fast is that you can do like eight, 16, 32, 64 objects at a time that you can push through synchronously. And uh, therefore, you know, it's getting processed and that allows you to have an awful lot of objects going on. Now, how does this for each know which objects you want to work with? Well, that's where all of these ref values here that have come through. These values that you put inside the for each brackets is basically saying, that you're going to for each loop through every entity that has these four components attached to it. So we created float data and we put float data onto our virus object. Now, when we create some other kind of entity and stick it into the system, if it doesn't have this float data I component attached to it, then it's not gonna get picked up by this for each. So these are essentially tags, okay? This is how you're finding a specific object. So now that you've got hold of all of the objects that have float data attached to them, in here you can do some calculations and actually change any of these values that you've passed through here, these components. So within this for each, you only have access to whatever values you've passed through here. These are the only things that you can change inside of the for each. So if you didn't pass through uh, float data and you wanted to use the speed, you couldn't because you don't have access to it. You couldn't change the speed either because it wouldn't even know that it, it exists. If you leave translation out and you try and set the position, it's not going to let you because it hasn't picked up that. So it's just picking up these components, 
changing the data values in these components, which are then linked back to the entities that pick up that data and use it. Okay, so hopefully that makes a little bit of sense uh, and it will start to sink in the more we create and the more entities we create and start to distinguish between them. So first of all, uh, let's create a float and we're going to create two floats because we actually want to update the physics velocity, which is here with a random velocity. Okay, so as I said earlier on, inside of these loops, you can't access a lot of the sort of traditional Unity things because they're often referenced values, okay, which means that they're not sort of static in memory like structs and um, all these new values like floats and float threes and things. So if you try to use random dot range inside of your for each, it's going to go, no, nah, don't like it. You can't use it. So instead we have to sort of come up with some other sort of values in here. And so I'm going to use sine and cosine because those two functions actually return values between minus one and one and they oscillate over time. So you don't get a random value, but you will get one that changes and allows your uh, molecules to sort of float back and forward. Okay, so we're going to create the sign. The sign's going to be the uh, math, the new math library dot sign. And inside of here, I have to put some kind of a value, which sign traditionally wants you to give it degrees, but it doesn't matter what you give it. Uh, you're still going to get a value between minus one and one. So we're going to use delta time to progress our time. Then I'm going to add on the actual x value, position dot value dot x of this particular entity. And then I'm going to also multiply by 0 0.5 f inside to get a value between uh, 0 and 1. And this here, if you uh, reduce this down, then you're going to get uh, slower movements across the screen. But you can also then multiply it by speed. Now speed, in this case, we've got stored in float data dot speed. And that's the random value that we set earlier on back in our ECS manager. Now we can do the same thing with cosine. So let's just copy that and put in C for cosine. Let's change that to cos. And I will use the Y value in this case for the cos value. Then I'm going to now create a vector with that. And that will be float three DIR equals new float three. And that will be Let's use the S value for the X, the C value for the Y, and we'll use S again in there. And then we will adjust our physics value. So physics.linear, this is the linear value that's in this component here for this entity. And let's go plus equals DIR to update its direction. Now, of course, you can play around with these values all you like. You try use tan, you can multiply by a different value here, you could do something different here. The most important thing I think in this whole thing is because sine and cosine and any other of these um, particular functions that work with geometry and that progress and oscillate through time as you're moving on is that you've got DT somewhere in here so that each time you loop through you've actually progressed through time along some kind of X axis on a graph to give you this continued oscillation. Now very quickly let's press play because I'm running out of video time and we should see our oscillating viruses and there they are they're quite fast so you might want to slow them down I guess that's up to you. Okay, when we come back in the next video, we're going to add in our red blood cells. But in the meantime, you might like to have a little bit of a think about how you might do that. Thanks for watching. Please support the development of more superb online learning content by subscribing. And as always, visit holistic3d.com to learn more about awesome games development books and tutorials.